And we are live with Book and a Beverage, which with the wonderful Amber Toro. And her debut novel is released in what just over three weeks from now? Yep, right so, at 22 days. Yeah, you get so what is your novel? 24th and of April, April, I think, is what you're looking for, Mike. Do what? 24th of April. Let's be specific now. Okay, the 24th of April. Jeez, we're gonna be that way today. <laughs> How long before we talk about Star Trek Discovery? <laughs> do not bring that up, Amber. Do not. <laughs> uh, Are you a fan, ahead. Amber? Okay, I don't know Star Trek Discovery, but I did grow up on Star Trek Generation. So right. we, we can talk that if you want. We don't want to. <laughs> so, about your book? We want. Your book is more important. No, bro, I'm not. Bo says I'm feisty already. Absolutely not. Mike brought it up first before you logged in, Bo. It's not me. So Bo is here. Welcome, Bo. Uh, we got your book. We're saying hi to Bo. And yes, he is feisty. So what uh, what went wrong in your life to make you want to become a writer? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> it's actually something I always wanted to do ever since I was a little kid. Always had, you know, a big imagination and always loved stories and, you know, used to write stories as a kid that I'm sure were awful, but I really enjoyed them. Um, so yeah, I just always enjoyed thinking about what could be. And so what were the, the steps that got you to your first book? Was there like contests or anything or, you know, school newspaper or whatever? So, you know, growing up, I did write, you know, some through high school, I did cre uh, creative writing in college. And then I took a big break. I had kids and I actually like didn't read a lot. I didn't write a lot. Um, I felt like very focused on my career. And then when I started writing again, it was actually professionally. I did content creation and blog posts and SEO and all of that. Um, and then, you know, you got you get to a point in life where you have a little bit more time. And I started reading fiction again. And two years ago, um, my dad passed away suddenly. And I thought about what I would regret not having done if I were to go now, and it was writing this book. So I decided that I it was time to start writing it. That, that's a damn well-reasoned answer. We're not used to that kind of thing here. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, I'm just eating a chocolate bunny. Um, <laughs> what, uh, what's your day job, and, and do you still have it? Yeah, so I'm director of data science at Machine Learning Startup. Um, so yeah, I build machine learning models and run a team uh, in the higher education space. Run that's, away, she's an AI. I was gonna say that, <laughs> now, that sounds much more like mathematic -y than than we normally get here. So you and Mike actually have education on your side. Well done. Ugh, really? <laughs> One of us does. <laughs> So is, is the uh, is the dream to be able to call in one day and say I'm done or just I, <laughs> I really like my job. So to be clear, like it's really fun. And actually a lot of the inspiration for my book came from my job because we do have these fully sentient starships. Um, so, you know, for now, I just really enjoy doing both. It is a startup. So the dream is eventually to sell the company. Right. And then we'll see where we're at. Then you'll be independently wealthy and you can do whatever, like you know, right. <laughs> so choose to work for yourself. I mean, that's the ultimate dream, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it, it probably is. Um, we do want to touch on a couple of things. We'll get to your book in a minute. But you are running right now a Kickstarter campaign. And it's the last day, right? So I'm going to throw the Kickstarter thing up there. If anybody wants to take a few minutes and jot this down. Um, it's got... You say about 15 hours left? Yep, it's ending tomorrow morning. So, and yeah, you about have 15. 123 backers with a goal of $2,000. And so far, you've been pledged 5,433. That's kind of fantastic. Yeah, um, it's really awesome. How, how, let me just read this out here. Umbra is an intergalactic space opera adventure story with slow burn enemies to lovers romance. So you, you've hit a lot of gates there. 
Um, how did you manage to get 123 backers for five and a half grand? I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I've just honestly, it's, I think it's really all the credit goes to this community. Um, I've been part of the bookstagram community for the past year. I've been doing arc reading and made a lot of really great friends. And um, I've learned a lot from other people in the community. I've looked at how some of my friends have launched their Kickstarters and kind of took tips from that. And then I have a really amazing ARC team that has done a great job of getting the news out and sharing across social media. So it's really just the community has been really supportive and has helped get the word out. You have a sprayed edges hardcover edition. Where'd you get that made? So those I have a print. I'll have to check the name, but yeah, I have a printer um, in Canada that was able to do everything that I wanted to do. Um, so yeah, I just, I sent all the specs and was like, can you guys do this? I sent it to probably like, I don't know, five different printers. Most of them were like, we could do part of that. Um, and I found one that could do everything I wanted. So nice. Now yeah. I see in there that you had your, your top tier was that sprayed edge hardcover uh, for a hundred bucks and you had it limited to 25. Um, now your goal was only $2,000. So when you were setting this up and, and putting it all together and you put down 25, realizing doing the math in your head, that that would be $2,500 if all 100 of them went. Did you think that was going to happen? Spoiler alert, um, it did. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I the reason I limited them to 25 is that those are going to be custom done, the stenciled edging. Um, and so I actually set that with the idea that, you know, we're, we're doing that piece ourselves. And so I want to make sure, you know, they're really high quality and we have time to to do that. So that was set with the intention of that's what I could handle. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you had to actually learn another skill for this as well. I will be learning another skill. So, yep, I'm going to go to, you know, the, the uh, Goodwill and get some books and do some practicing. I have some friends that have done it and they've turned out really beautiful. So, um, yeah, we'll be doing that. <laughs> so tell us about your book. That th That is ostensibly why you're here. We get there eventually. Yeah. Um, what do you want to know about Umbra? So how many POVs do you have in the book? There are three POVs. Um, it's, yeah, it's third person. There's three POVs. Um, so tell us about the three POVs. Sure. So Skyla, that's our main character, and she is an ex-Navy officer who wanted to be left alone. And she, you know, her plans kind of get foiled when her starship gets a strange alien virus and she ends up on this backwater space station. And then the next POV is Hinata, and he is a very honorable uh, Navy officer who has been exiled for a failure. And he's running this space station where Skyla ends up. And then the final POV is Freya. She is also a naval officer, but she's also a black ops operative for a crime syndicate. Um, and so she's kind of doing this double, double role and has maybe a little bit of, I know people tend to not like her in the beginning, but perhaps you'll like her by the end. Yeah, you've got, you've got the whole kind of trifecta going here. Like he else said, you've got like a James Bond kind of thing going. A uh, little, little bit of, I don't want to say mystery, but um, how'd you keep it all straight? Um, I don't know. It's just all in my head, the, the way that it comes together. So I wrote the whole thing and I definitely had a vision for how everything would go. And then it was through the drafting process that then you go back and you're like, oh yeah, here's all the connections. And that was, that was a really fun part because yeah, everything came together. There were no major issues, but then you went back and solidified how everything, you know, is set up and, and the connections. And that was the really fun part. You have like a, a wall of sticky notes with little red yarn connecting things. I wish I've seen people with their, with their, um, their boards and they look really pretty. No, everything is in my head. So how many times did you, you're on chapter 20 and you're like, you know, 
if back in chapter four I change this to this other thing, then that would really pay off now. You then have to go all the way back to chapter four and change something. I I don't write that way, I guess. Um, oh, so I write I straight write through. <laughs> yeah, I just write straight through. And yeah. then when I go back and I read, like I read it, I see where the connections could go in. I didn't have to change anything structurally, um, luckily. So yeah, it was more just going in and being like, oh, it'd be perfect to add this in here because it's going to tie in later. Yeah. So you're a discovery writer. Yeah, I lean more towards pantsing, but I would say I'm a, a planster. I like to have my main points. I just don't know how we're going to get there until we sit down and do it. Okay. And how long did this take you to write from the time you started? Excuse me. From the, yeah. So it took almost two years. Um, part of that is really learning right how to write a book. Um, definitely, I draft a lot faster now because um, I'm very consistent now. When I first started, I was like, oh, I'll wait until I think of the next thing instead of just writing down and sitting down and writing the next day, which is what I learned actually works better for me is just keep going and you'll figure it out as you go. Um, but yeah, it took close to two years. Also, the editing process was a learning, a whole learning thing as well, you know, learning where to actually spend your time for, for it to develop and it all to come together. So I think both of those things will be faster for book two. But yeah, it took a bit for for the first book. Now you you uh, you gave credit to your art team. How did you find a team of people to do that, and how many did you have? Yeah. Um, so in December, I started putting up on my social media. I don't know. I think about once a month, I would just do a call that, hey, I'm looking for art readers, and I took art reader art reader applications from December through March. And in that time, I had over 100 people sign up um, and be interested in the book. So, you know, and then what I was looking for is people that I thought would be excited in the book. Like that was that was it. That's I want to connect with readers that would like my book. So I'm, I'm obligated to ask. How many uh, what social platforms and what's your followership like if you had 100 people actually respond positively to that request? Yeah. Um, so Instagram's my main platform. It's, I guess, the one where I understand it the best and where I know the most people. Um, I have 10,000 followers on Instagram. And so that is where most of my follow, most of my art readers are from there. Um, I did have some from Twitter. I have like 3,000 followers on Twitter. Um, 10,000. I mean, I guess this is kind of <laughs> stuff, you know, and, and yeah. Mike and I obviously aren't there. I mean, you know, Mike has me yeah. and I. Yeah, but other than that, I think we're we're kind of at ten thousand. Holy shit! Yeah, we nearly yeah. spit out our teeth when you said that. <laughs> oh, yeah, that so that, at that point. So I've been on that platform for a long time. Um, so that's part of it, and then it's just like consistency and being part of the community. Um, that's and that's how I have the most fun. Um, I don't know. I'm there to connect with people that have similar interests and. You know, I post content that I enjoy and I enjoy making and it goes how it goes. One thing you said there <clears throat> leads me to this conclusion. Tell me if I'm wrong. You're a millennial. Yes. Okay. Because you said I have fun there. Uh, <laughs> I, I know like Mike and I deal with it sometimes, but I don't know if either of us have had ever said we have fun there. <laughs> Yeah, um, I like it a lot because of the community I've met there. Um, I work from home. And so I, you know, I have my little kids and I have my tech job. And I found some really cool friends that, you know, they're also writers and they're also juggling multiple things. And how we found each other was through Instagram. So that yeah, makes it fun. I think writers juggling multiple things is, I, yeah, I think most, a lot of people will put those two boxes. Yeah. Amber is a great Twitter moot. I don't know what that means. <laughs> oh, good. Woo. I don't either. <laughs> I, know, I know what an ent moot is. <laughs> you know? So, Amber, um, the spaceship, I'm guessing it's called Umber. Um, so, actually, Umbra is that word is not in the book at all, which is actually something one of my beta readers commented on. Um, so all three of the book titles, they have to do with astronomy terminology. 
and then the vibe of the book and its role in the overall um, story arc. Okay, so the sentence sentient starship is not a POV, which I think would be amazing to try to write and not in a good way. Uh, but Wait, they, the starship is sentient? Yeah, like, so there are, so there's four characters that are starships in Umbra. Um, the main one is Pele, and that is Skyla's starship. So she is often with Skyla and, you know, part of the banter. And she's actually a fan favorite. People really love her. So uh, did, did you ever watch um, Farscape? I have not, but I would like to, because I think there are some similarities in the ships. Well, sentient ships, yeah. 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 And if I remember right... What was it? And it doesn't suck, so that's yeah. a bonus. My all-time <laughs> favorite sci-fi series is Farscape, yeah. then probably Babylon 5, and then we might talk about something this century, but maybe not. <laughs> so, so you have four sentient star starships, you have three POVs. Where does this take place? Are we on Earth? Are we out in the galaxy? Where are we at? Yeah, so it is about 10,000 years after humanity has left Earth and we are in a different galaxy and then we are spread across galaxies that are connected by wormhole rings. Um, the majority of the story does take place in one galaxy, which is where the central government is. FTL? Um, so, I mean, so it's wormholes, right? So it's not, I guess, I don't know if that's the same thing, right? Because you're bending the universe and then going right. through a wormhole. And that's but. how you solve your FTL conundrum, and, yes. and you don't have to. You don't have to worry about, you know, the the online hooligans saying, "Well, that won't work." You know, like <laughs> science fiction is supposed to work. Yeah. So the yeah the science in Umbra should be plausible in a far future. Um, I did read some books on astrophysics and quantum mechanics. Um, it's not a hard sci. It's not a hard sci-fi, but um, there are mentions of hard sci-fi elements because I wanted it to feel real. Now that's not my specialty. I'm a data scientist, mm -hmm. so it is possible that they're not. You know that it's not fully um, capable of something scientifically, but it should. It should be. Yeah, Mike, we're going to have to go back and find that. Um, what, what are we into this now? About seventeen and a half minutes find that little phrase she just said, I went out and read some books on astrophysics and whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't, those words have never been uttered on this program before. I guarantee it. Uh, so how many kids do you have? I have two. So you have a full-time job, you have two kids and you write on the side. Um, you, where, when did you start hating yourself? <laughs> I think I, I just like to be busy. Yeah. Um, yeah. My husband is like, you should relax more. And I'm like, relaxing is not relaxing for me. Like do, you know, doing things is relaxing for me. So. You got a book that has to come out in three weeks. <laughs> There's no relaxing between now. This and is not relaxing. <laughs> yeah. Right now it's not relaxing. Drafting you, is you've relaxing. Done this before, certainly, right? <laughs> no. No, nope, this is really your first time doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Once again. I will tell you the same thing we told someone last week. The bar has been set very low for you. Okay. It only gets better from here. Yeah. There's only better hosts out there. Um, <laughs> what, um, so what made you decide to answer the, the big, you know, Fugelhorn call from Mike's Twitter account to, uh, to do this? Oh, so, okay. If you're asking interviews, I've done a couple, but yeah, I put, I put just, I think a comment up on my Twitter that I was doing a couple of interviews and I think that's how we connected. Yeah. I just, I thought it was fun. Like I like to talk about my book. It's fun to meet different people in, you know, different corners of the internet. And I think this is a great way to do it. Yep. Mike's internet is round. <laughs> Trapezoidal actually. You're from out west, yeah? Yeah, so I'm originally from Seattle, and I now live in Utah. So you kind of migrated east. You made it yeah. into John Smith or Joseph. More south. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah, more south. Yeah, we needed some more sunshine. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> the high desert. Yeah. So what do you do for fun when you're not hurting kids and, and writing and putting out wickedly successful first time Kickstarter campaigns and doing this? Yeah. Uh, me and my husband are both road cyclists. So we spend a lot of time biking in the mountains. We race criterium. Um, so yeah, when, when I, huh? Let's talk bikes for a minute. What are you riding? All right. I ride a Fizari. That's a local Utah brand. Okay. And it's excellent. Carbon? Yeah. Nice. Come on. Get into details with me. Let's go. Get into the details. I don't know the full specs of my bike. I do know it's really nice. Um, it rides really great. I also know that I should get a new one this year. Um, oh, we'll see. You know, you know the correct <laughs> number of bicycles to have, right? It's plus one. And plus one. You bet. There it is. <laughs> do, do yeah, you so you watch, ride? Do you ever watch the GCN show? Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. We watch it sometimes. Well, my my husband always watches it. But yeah, I mean, and I watch. We watch the uh, the big grand tours, the Tour de France, the Giro d'Italia, and the Vuelta. Yeah. Nice, awesome. It's. I was out in in um, Eastern Washington for a while in 2015, and I loved riding out there because it the the, the shoulders were really wide, and it wasn't very hilly. Yeah, we're pretty was, flat. Right. Yeah, it was really nice just along the banks of the Columbia. Um, oh, yeah. Out here in southwest Virginia, to go on a 10-mile ride, you're getting about 900 feet of elevation gain. I mean, you just cannot yep. escape the hills. And one of the first things yeah. I did when I did buy my bike is um, I, I changed out the back derailleur for a long cage just because the it just it wasn't set up right for hills. And, yeah. of course, you know, I'm a fat pig, so I'm not set up right for hills. And it doesn't matter. But oh yeah, I used to try and climb on a TT bike. It's awful. Like having the right setup feels. It's so much more fun. You ride? Oh, you ride TT? Time trial. I oh. I used to. Yeah, I used to ride TT because I did triathlon for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. and so I just rode my tri bike. But it's climbing on those is terrible. That's an exercise in just pain. Yeah. Um, you did like full length Ironman. So I've done a full distance triathlon um, with the Iron Cowboy back when he did the Conquer 100. If you heard about that event, um, that's my only time I've done the full distance, which it's brutal. So for anybody here who, who's not up on their triathlons, um, a full triathlon is like, what, 2.4 mile swim, uh, 112 mile bike ride followed by a marathon. So, yeah, I, yeah. I think there's probably not a lot of those folks in the writing community. Um, just like, you know, you go to a Comic-Con and you, do, I, I've said this to Mike before, <laughs> you don't see a lot of triathletes at Comic-Con, which is uh, probably one of the truer things I've ever said. But no, that's very cool that you, that, and then that takes a lot of time to do all that too. That's right. That's yeah. Right. What Bo says I'm hearing is Amber will kick your button and tell you a book after. <laughs> She'll tell you a book before that, if their Kickstarter is anything to go by. Good grief. And if you say no, she will run you down. And she'll have enough energy to do it too. <laughs> do you have those little uh, things on your bikes where you can take the kids with you? You know, the, the little things that you pull behind you? No, my kids are monsters. So, I mean, my daughter's my size and then my son is like a hundred pounds. I'm not, ta I'm not pulling oh, yeah, them anywhere. <laughs> they're riding their own bikes. They need to ride their own bikes. They are, they're competitive swimmers. So they spend most of their time in the water. Yeah. yeah fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, I did a sprint try once. I spent most of my time trying not to drown. <laughs> a lot of kind of looking up at the sky on your back and kind of wishing it were over. But so Go ahead. <laughs> when you're not riding over to Brandon Sanderson's house and back, um, you're at work trying to plot the overthrow of the human civilization. That sounds about right. Okay. Yeah. I love Pinky in the brain. Same thing we do every night, brain. So I have to ask, have you got into any Twitter discussions, and I'm using the term discussion loosely, about AI? Because um. <laughs> that's a way to get very opinionated people very loud. 
Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, on, I actually did talk pretty extensively on my stance on AI on a podcast interview, but that's the only place that I've really gotten into it. Um, also, like, uh, just there's a writing group that I was in that again, I just wrote, like, I just wrote an explanation of how the generative AI works and kind of the ethical in implications. And I was like, I'm just going to leave this here. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not here to get into a big debate. Um, I just think that a lot of people are perhaps not educated about what it is. And so if you actually tell them what it is and that, you know, right now it does come down to an ethical decision of, you know, what you're going to use, and then you can let them decide, you know, where they're, how they feel about that. I, my, my boss at work is always going, you know, everyone is anti-AI, and I guess they think there's a gremlin living in their computer that corrects their grammar for them. Um, yeah. So, yeah, AI, that, that's been out of the bottle for 20 years. Everything is AI, right? Um, and I know, like, the algorithms that I work on, I actually have our company has a patent pending, and my name is on that. And the alg algorithms that we've developed, they are to support the counselors, the enrollment counselors who are overworked and underpaid. And a lot of AI is like that, where, you know, we are trying to support um, industries that have more data than they know what to do with. And AIs are very good at dealing with data and looking for patterns and then surfacing um, insights for humans to do their jobs better. Um, so there's, I mean, there's a lot of great, very, you know, wonderful and ethical uses for AI. I, it, should we be addressing you as Dr. Toro? No. Oh, okay. Would that no. be a address? No. Oh. I just, nope. I don't have my PhD. I would like to do that at some point, but I'm too busy right now. Maybe my, when my kids get older. Are we'll you see. sure you should be on sure you do. dissertation? <laughs> you can add one more thing on. You know, the oh, yeah. competitive yeah. biking, the raising kids, AI, okay. writing books, Kickstarters. You got room. You got space. Yeah, so much you, space. <laughs> you'd, have to, you'd have to give up doing this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, that would that would totally give me enough time. <laughs> mm. oh, I've got to start writing my questions down. I keep forgetting them. Oh, well, I count on you for this. Mike, go to your list, quick. Uh, well, okay, this was for what branch of the service were you in and how many? Oh, wait, that is not the proper. Dude. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we're we're looking here. We're looking. This you can tell we we put a lot of preparation into these, but we try this to is fun. do it so it feels <laughs> I have, natural and um, doesn't you know give Mike or I too big a head. So so I have one of my favorite questions: Is did did you put anyone who you know into your book, and did you kill them? <laughs> no. So there is one character that I would say is maybe has some traits of some of some people that I know, but there's no character that is entirely, you know, based on a person. And I did not kill anybody that is based on someone I know. Uh, okay, regarding the, <clears throat> I just want to jump back into the AI thing for a minute because I've talked to some artists and everything. And, and I think those are the people who are really against AI, right? Um, I will say that in doing a little stuff for the book I'm currently writing, I did go on for the first time ever to a couple of these AI programs and just tried to get it to give me an image. And I thought it was pretty clear what I wanted. And after 50 tries, it still had not given me the image I actually wanted. Right. And I, I don't yeah. think it was difficult, but I think there's a really good use for that kind of thing for a writer to get a visual if that helps him or her um, and then present that to an artist and say, this is the kind of thing I'm looking for. Right. Um, I think where artists get wrapped around the axle with it is that people go out and do that and use that in place of the art. So that, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, so on, the, on the one hand they're saving themselves money, but on the other hand, they are perhaps taking money from other people. And that's just how some of those folks see it, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But yeah, you can't get away from the fact that we've all been using AI every time we go into a Google search. You know, we've been doing it yeah. for 20 years now. Uh, yeah. But it's just, you know, how, I guess, in the very near future, 
you know, when we start seeing books written by AI that don't suck, right? How are we going to feel when, when, you know, our books aren't selling any more than they already are um, to a book that was written by nobody or somebody just punching in a couple of ideas, but not actually taking the time and effort that you've taken to write and market and all the other kind of thing that book. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I know that I, well, I'm not trying to fall on either side of this. I understand there's a lot of nuance involved in the whole AI debate, but I think it's only a debate depending on how you look at it. I, I there's no debate in are we going to use AI or right. um, are we using it? That's just going to happen. So yeah. So what are they saying over here? AI is the genie we let out. It will revolutionize the world. We just have to make sure we don't lose art in favor of preference. Yeah, but EL, the uh, Americans in particular have always been really, really bad about choosing what's better over what's quicker, cheaper, easier. Uh, I don't know how old you are, but all you have to do is go back to the early 80s with Betamax versus VHS. Right, I knew you were going there. I absolutely had no <laughs> doubt that's where this was going. I mean, it was when is he going to say better? better? Right, and what happened? VHS, you could record longer and it was cheaper. And it, depending on where you go to look for information, there there are really bizarre reasons why VHS won out on that, and you can go Google that for yourself. Um, but yeah, we're not the we're not the best choosers of things sometimes uh bo says zach argyle said it best can we stop having ai that takes away jobs people like to do like to do yeah. let's focus our billions on making ai do the jobs people hate that would be most of them yes but i agree bo I'm, I'm absolutely el humans are happy to sell their souls the problem there el is how cheaply we sell them not the fact that we do uh, so Open for me, I'm good. I, I am Gen X. I am unoffendable. I'm the youngest of seven children. You cannot offend me. So EL actually had a question, which is good because, you know, we didn't come prepared. So <laughs> I almost got him to spit it out his nose. Anyway, um, so what is your favorite problem to write, Amber? I'm trying to think. So like a situation that they got into in Umbra? Like how I'm interpreting that question. I'm thinking, so go ahead. Oh, I'm just thinking like plot wise, like what is the issue that they're trying to solve? Yeah. So, I mean, one part that I like didn't know how we were getting to the next piece and ended up being really fun and actually um, a part of the story people really enjoyed and ended up being really action packed is where they're trying to think also how to not give away spoilers. Um, but they end up needing to go on this salvage mission and it takes them to a planet that has a destroyed Dyson sphere uh, and this um, you know dense debris field. And they're trying to problem solve how to get down to the surface and how to, um, they need to collect um, some tech on the salvage mission and that whole that whole thing i didn't know what was going to happen and it was really fun to write yep so, so do you go out of your way to find like really obscure kind of things or do you try to keep the references general enough where plebes like me could understand it yeah so it is a soft sci-fi and i would say well half of my beta readers were not sci-fi readers they were fantasy romance readers and they could understand the tech and they loved the tech um, and a lot of the feedback I've gotten back from ARC readers is that mix of the ones that are sci-fi readers. They're like, I love how like my nerd heart is so happy and I can nerd out on the tech, but you make it presentable for people that are not um, from a STEM background. So it does kind of bridge, bridge that gap um, between the two. Yeah, I think what a lot of, especially hard sci-fi misses is the character development, you know, the, the person yeah. in the equation. And if yeah. you've got a romantic subplot going through, you you can't ignore that. Yeah. And I personally love character-driven stories, and I do have trouble connecting with stories that don't develop the characters. 
So the characters are very complex, very well developed, um, even though it has a great plot that they are moving through. Was was there a point in running this? <laughs> and the laser cannon went pew pew, says Herman Hunter's <laughs> words. Uh, was there a point where you were writing this where you, you kind of like just pushed yourself back from the desk and said, what the hell am I doing? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're the unicorn in this whole thing. <laughs> so are you a dedicated sci-fi writer or are there other genres you want to write? Are you going to do romanticy? Or so I do have a YA fantasy that is 70% drafted. I wrote that one for my son um, because I wrote a um, a gaslamp fantasy novelette for a anthology, and that mm -hmm. one was for my daughter. And so I promised him a story. It was supposed to be a novelette to match hers, and his story kind of got out of control. So it it's full length novel. <laughs> so you got to do a novel for her now. Uh, I know. I talked to her about it. I'm like, do you want me to rework yours? She's like, no, I love mine, but you could write me another one. <laughs> Uh, is uh, is Umber, is this the first of a series or is this a standalone? Yeah, this is the first of a trilogy, a planned trilogy. And you already know how it's going to end? I do. I've actually already written the ending. Um, I don't write out of order in general, but I there was this uh, closing scene that I just needed to write. So that is actually already written, how it, how it ends in the very end. And are there going to be novellas that are attached to this trilogy, or is it really just going to be three books? And if you say three books, I don't believe you. So there's no planned novellas. Okay. Um, there's already requests for like things on side characters and different things. So we'll see what um, comes from that. Because every world grows much more than the author plans. Yeah. Yeah. For now, the focus is the trilogy, though. And then my brain, I can have brain space to think of other pieces. Bo asks if you plan to do Kickstarter releases for all your future books. And before you answer, I would say to Bo, why wouldn't she? <laughs> yeah. So no, I definitely plan on it. I thought this was really great. It was a really great way to, you know, get the book out there, talk about it. They are all pretty special editions. Um, so I of course want matching pretty special editions for the whole trilogy. Fair. Absolutely. Yeah. And you'll get better at it, you know, as uh, yeah. you, people will start wanting art, hopefully, and all that kind of thing. That's cool. Um, yeah. Do you have any any uh, intention or plans to start hitting the Comic-Con circuit or any of, of those type of things? No. <laughs> um, I don't think I have time uh, for anything else right now. You don't have time to stand for eight and nine hours at a time on the weekend and just <laughs> implore people to come visit you without looking desperate? <laughs> it's fun. You really yeah, no. Do one for the people watching aspect of it, and so you can sit there and go, "Bro was right. There are no triathlons here." <laughs> yeah, I don't. We'll have to see. Right now, that sounds very overwhelming. I like feel it's like there's enough just launching the the book. It's underwhelming. It is very <laughs> underwhelming. You're just sitting there going, "I can't look desperate, but someone talk to me." <laughs> Yeah, and then the introvert in me thinks this sounds very terrifying. So, Mike and I are hitting a button at the same time, trying to bring up the same comment. <laughs> no, they are a lot of fun, actually. I mean, the, the first time you go, there's a little bit of nerves of you know, but um, people at Comic Cons generally, just despite their their lack of triathlon skills, um, <laughs> they're very welcoming, regardless of who you are or what happens to be your particular thing. And it's, it's kind of, it's, I, I, I want to say nice, but I mean a different word. It's, um, ah, it, I'll just say nice. It's very nice in the fact that you can watch the whole thing go by and realize that of all the weirdness you see, nobody's, saying people are weird or anything else they're yeah. everyone is very accepting of everyone else and it's a it's a really nice community and super friendly That's so cool. and you can learn um you, i mean you'll meet other vendors and stuff who will teach you all you gotta do is ask them 
It's like, oh, where did you get this? Or how do you set this up or blah, blah, blah. And people will talk to you all day about that because you've got eight to 13 hours a day with nothing else to do. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. How would you handle eight to 13 hours with nothing else to do in a day? Well, Bo just said I could share a uh, a table with Caden. So, I mean, that's a, a good idea. <laughs> then I wouldn't be totally alone. <laughs> well, yeah, you probably want to wait until you have two or three books before you go. Yeah. I agree. I don't okay. think it makes sense to go for one. So, not, not unless you, I mean, you go into it knowing you're going to lose money probably and yeah. just do it for the experience and to meet some people. But I mean, you've got 10,000 people on your socials. It's not like you need to build a mailing list, right? So, as, uh, you know, collecting 40 names at a, at a con isn't really going to help you a tremendous amount. But it is interesting to go just for the experience of it. Yeah. No, I definitely think it would be cool when I have more time. So what did you wish you knew two years ago that you know now about writing? So something I think that, well, like one of my biggest learnings, I would say is how important it is to find your community. Obviously two years ago when I started, I was like just me and my laptop. Um, and then finding, you know, finding people that, yeah, they're also writing and they're also going through the same things that you are and be, having people you can share kind of those ups and those downs with. Um, I didn't realize that it's such like a team sport. Um, you know, you need, you need people to beta read for you and make sure that, you know, it's being received the way that you intended. And, um, I just hadn't realized how much, um, community involvement there is. And I was lucky that I had, um, gotten into the community as an arc reader. I hadn't gotten into the community as an author. Um, but through that, like when I did realize, oh my gosh, I need to meet other, you know, writers and make those connections. Like I already had like one foot in that space and that really helped. Yeah, this is a tremendous um, and, and a paradoxically kind of fascinating thing that we do in that it is by its nature very lonely because you can only have one set of hands on the keyboard, but you do need that group around you to, to really see it through, right, to yeah. answer questions or whatever. And I'm going to take just a little aside from this, and even though Mike doesn't have 10,000 followers, anywhere he does have 1495 on twitter so if anybody out there could go tell people we mike needs five more people so he can feel like a real human being and get to 1500 <laughs> because it's like, you know it's one of those numbers that he just needs to have and if he gets it he will wear a cupcake on his head in the next episode he will <laughs> I'm, I'm looking here, and I think everybody who's watching us currently, at least, is already a Twitter friend of mine. Uh, but they know people. Well, Bo's there. He knows everyone, so. That's yeah. right. That's true. So, you know, if uh, if any of Amber's friends are watching, um, they can go out and click the button for Mike. Click the button for Mike. <laughs> click the button for Mike. Sorry, this is supposed to be about you, Amber. We always turn it into us. So. Yeah, this was fun. Well, <laughs> it's uh, it's the Coke Euro. <laughs> so, um, what you are you said you're working on the fantasy novel for your son, correct? Yeah. Do you have a date when you think that will be ready? Oh, you have the same question he does. <laughs> <laughs> He's Great. been asking me. <laughs> He's like, you are taking forever. I'm like, I got to focus on Umbra right now, buddy. Um, <laughs> Did you make him a character in the story? Huh? Did you make him a character in the story? He is not a character in the story, um, but it is for him because the main character is a boy. Um, so, and the, well, he's a bear, actually. Uh, he's a black bear who wakes up as a, a young man and doesn't know why. Um and that is what the story is about. A, a bear wakes up as a boy? Yes. Okay. Did, did you realize <laughs> was, he was a bear before? Is he, is he still yeah, having bear thoughts? Yeah, yeah, he does. He he definitely has, like, yeah, thoughts about things, like, as a bear, which was really fun to write. Ooh, berries. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh my gosh, Bo asked for the pitch for the fantasy novel. I haven't worked on it. <laughs> Cause that was like a, it was just a project that I did um, while my, while Umbra was with beta readers to keep me from going nuts. Um, so yeah, it was so that I had something to do instead of obsess over how they were reacting to Umbra. Wow, that is very healthy. I wish I would have done that. Right. All right. So, so you, you're going to finish this book up first before you go to, to part two of Umbra? No. Yeah, don't tell my son that. Uh, no, part two of Umbra is, is up next. Um, no, well, no. I will finish his story, but it is, I will probably finish it while um, book two of The Sunshine Stars is resting. So I need to finish drafting book two and then it will have to rest for a month. And that is probably enough time for me to finish drafting um, this story. How much do you write in a day? When I'm writing a good, like a uh, average is probably about 1500. So it's not that okay. much. You just do it yeah. every day. Yeah, I'm a big consistency fan. Yeah, well, I'm a yeah. fan of it. <laughs> but, you know, I'm a fan of a lot of things. But, you know, oh, yeah. So yeah. what is your favorite part of the writing process? Is it the first draft? Is it editing? Is it's it hitting drafting. send? Oh. It's drafting. I, I love it. Is your favorite part, Mike? <laughs> I love editing. Editing is my favorite part by far. So I like the beginning of editing, right? Where you're making all those connections and make it, making it feel really awesome. I hate the end of editing, editing where I'm agonizing over, is it this word? Is this the exact word that I want? Should it be a comma? Like that is hard for me. You know, I will tell you, it was there for a while when I'd get my book back from Roe because he's my editor. And I'm like, there's an argument to be made that I'm not even monolingual when I look at all the mistakes. <laughs> And, and it used to just like, I'm like, oh my God, I'm such a fraud. This last book I got back and I'm like, and that means I don't look like an idiot. And that means I don't look like an idiot. And I was like, oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> that's that's one way to look at it. But to, to to your point, Amber, I mean, there, I will go out of my way not to use effect, right? Because yeah. even at my age and with a degree in English, I still have to look up effect, affect. So I just want to use it. There are other words, right? That's the beauty of the English language. There are other ways around yeah. these things. There are four ways to say anything, at least. But for some reason, when I draft, I only pick one. And then I'm yeah. like, don't you know other words? <laughs> so is there a word or a phrase that you have to go back and search for because you overuse it? Uh, oh, yeah, there definitely was. What a there's probably several. Um, a lot of the stuff, though, that I had to be careful was was more like sci-fi specific. So like captain, ship, space, stars, like some of the stuff where it's going to be used in the book. Um, but yeah, there was quite a bit of those that it was like, is it is this really the one? I can't think if there was like another word. But yeah, there was plenty. Repetition. I did a lot of work on um, reducing repetition of words. I, I went through a phase where I just would just fit in every sentence, sometimes twice. And I'm just like, oh, my God, I've used that word so many times. So, oh, that, yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's on my list of things I have to go like, OK. I, I found a word in one of my first books that I used like 133 times in the course of the book. And I just went through and I think I went from like that to about six. Mm -hmm. I just had to. Oh, and wow. Again, thesaurus.com is my my uh, my friend. I yeah. always have a tab open to that when I'm writing, just just to find different words. Yeah. So I have to ask if your story about with your son has a bear in it. It's not a space bear, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what? I've gotten that question. They're like, yeah, space bear, <laughs> but no, it's. It's not a space bear. It is like a gas lamp fantasy. He lives in, you know, the woods on the edge of a alpine town. Yeah. Hey, boo -boo. The ranger brought it. <laughs> so, and have you read Wistful Sending by Joe Byrne? What is it? Uh, JCM Byrne here. He wrote Wistful Sending where he actually has space bears. That's why I asked you the question. Oh, really? He does have space bears? I think that's brilliant. Um, I have not read it. 
and they sound Russian. So, I mean, what is that's, not? Oh my gosh, that's excellent. So, what is what is your son most looking forward to in his story? I mean, has he given you ideas or? <clears throat> oh yeah, he discusses things with me. Um, yeah, there is a piece I can't share it because it's spoilery, but he will very much make sure you know that he came up with that part. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, no, I've talked through the plot with him and he's been like, oh, you should do this. And sometimes I say yes. And sometimes I'm like, no, buddy. <laughs> but this is, I mean, this has got to <clears throat> have that kind of lovely effect with your kids that maybe they're starting to write a little bit. Do you get them journaling or anything like that? Yeah. My son has a comic. It's called Donut Man. Um, and it, yeah, his right. main character is a donut man. So... <laughs> Like a man who likes donuts or a man who is shaped like a donut? A man who is shaped like a donut. With a hole in the middle and everything? Yes. Mm -hmm. Does he have to run from police? I don't know. He hasn't yet. Is he Canadian? No. Like a Tim Hortons donut? <laughs> I don't think so. Fair play. <laughs> well, Doug and Bob reference. Don't worry about it. It's all right. You're just checking to see if if um, Tim McKay is still on the chat with us. Oh well, no, it's yeah. living in Utah. She might she might have you know had some of these references. It's a very obscure reference. I just like to throw stuff out like that every now and then to see if people are paying attention. That's all. I'm not insinuating you're not paying attention. I'm just going to dig a hole. Go ahead. <laughs> so Amber, how many books do you read a year? Last year I read a lot. Last year was a big, a big year, like 90. Um, this year will be like less because it takes a lot of time to edit a book. Yeah. So yeah, this year it's more going to be like 50. So it takes, you do that in your spare time. So yeah, to relax at night, to get my brain to stop thinking. Um, I like to read because then I think about the story instead of everything else. Did you say 90? Yeah. Like that, yeah. Last year was a lot. That's not typical. Um, as I got excited because I got into the arc reading. I was like, oh, this is so exciting, you know. Um, but yeah, no, it's typically more like 40 or 50. Oh, wow. Well, that's, that's just a about week. one a week, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I won't even tell you the book I've been, quote, unquote, reading. So I have the audio book. It's four hours. I'm not finished yet. It's only a four hour book. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And it, I, I won't tell you when I started over a week ago. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I like audiobooks too. So that does help. I listen to audiobooks like while I bike and stuff. So that's part of it. And EL, I had to tell you, that's on you. You know, it was past the 30 minute mark. So you get cut off. He, he claims that I do this, but I clearly don't know how. So I'm innocent. Uh, let's see. So nobody's taking us up on following you on Twitter yet, Mike. No. Again. Sorry. That's okay. We'll get there. If nothing else, there'll be five more bots by the end of tomorrow. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Oh. Poor EO. So what else do you, you have less than 15 hours left on your uh, Kickstarter? What else do you want to say about your book to make people go out there and get it? That's and, a great sorry. question. And what is the next level of freebies to be given out if you get hit the next level? She's hit yeah. all the levels, I think, man. Have you, oh, no, have I you have. Played? We have a bunch of levels. The next level is a backer voted bonus scene. So backers, we'll, we'll figure out exactly if we hit that, how that would run, but um, like a scene they'd want from another character's point of view or maybe another scene they would like written. Um, so that is the next level. And what I will say about the book, I mean, so the pitch is it's an intergalactic um, space opera adventure story with a slow burn enemies to lovers romance. And that is what it is. Um, the arc responses from people that have read it it is really fun. It's really enjoyable. It absolutely delivers on everything I've been marketing. So if you have been, you know, following along about it, or if you haven't, go to the Kickstarter and watch the trailer so that you know what I'm talking about. 
Um, mm-hmm. It's a really fun book. It's really a really enjoyable read. So fast paced, slow burn, where is it pace wise? Yeah. So um, I've gotten some mixed comments on that. And I think it depends on what you typically read. Uh, most of the comments are that it's pretty fast paced. And those are going to be from sci fi readers. If you read outside sci fi, um, the beginning is slower paced because it is essentially epic sci fi. And so you have to set up all the pieces for the trilogy. Right. That being said, lots of things happen. So there are lots of exciting events that happen as we're setting, you know, the game board. Right. Um, and then the romance is slow burn. So, and it is very awesome slow burn. Um, everyone who is a romance reader that has read it has really enjoyed that aspect of the story. But don't remember, it doesn't have to be all exciting right away. I mean, we, we all know that Luke was a dirt farmer somewhere on Tatooine or whatever <laughs> it was. And water, water. Wanting continuously about wanting to go to do whatever the heck he wanted to do. So, I mean, it doesn't all need to be exciting right away. Yeah. And it definitely builds. So, you know, the beginning is setting the pieces. There are exciting things that happen there, but you know, where it gets really very action packed is probably the last 40 to 30%. Um, so yeah, it builds through the story. And are you going to enter your book in this is bow? The space bow equivalent of thought you were thought, of Smith bow. I thought you were having a stroke there. <laughs> <laughs> You're not that lucky. Um, the the self published science fiction contest. Are you going to be in there? And did we lose you? You're frozen. Either that, or you move as slow as we do. Man, she's really good at that. Wow, she's going to win every steering right. contest. If you can hear us, you're frozen. Oh, it's one way to get out. Okay. Of there you go. <laughs> okay, I froze, but I see you again. So, are you going to enter the self-published science fiction contest this year? Well, I would like to now that I know that's a thing. I don't know anything really about the contest circuit. It's like something I know I need to look into. So it costs you nothing. Um, and I don't, they say 300 books, but I don't know if they've actually got to 300 yet. They've only had three seasons and our good friend, JCM Byrne is a semifinalist, um, space. Yeah. So it's for sci-fi. Um, I think in August they'll put a call out for books and they do 300 books, 10 groups. They each get 30. They pick their, in that case, they pick quarter finalists, semifinalists and then finalist and it's just a great way to get your book out there meet a bunch of other authors who write the same thing you do and oh yes i did want to mention that but the trophy is oh my goodness you, if you need to go look at what is it the self-published science fiction contest and look at the trophy no we don't want to go look at it what is it and you, after this show is over after this is over you need to definitely i want to know what it is so it is a it is a ray gun. Oh, nice! Um, that they make themselves. Apparently, I don't know, it is very impressive looking. That sounds really cool. So yeah, I, I highly recommend it. You'll meet a whole bunch of other authors. Um, Spiffbo is for fantasy. It's been around a lot longer, and I did it this last year, and I was wow. Okay, I'm just playing with buttons, man. You carry on. Oh, okay. <laughs> And I think I had five written interviews. I was on several writers panels. Uh, I was a guest on several people's shows like this, but only they like prepared for the show, unlike us. Um, so it is a great way to get out there and to meet a lot of other people, which, you know, you need, you only know 10,000 people on right. Instagram. So, you know, you can clearly get that to 20. Um, but that sounds yeah. really fun. I highly yeah, recommend it. Might, it might it's 1,495 followers having just joined Twitter like six minutes ago. You can you can easily get to 20. I joined in May, so I'm hoping to have 2,000 by May, but I don't think everyone will get there. So, oh well, maybe 1,500. You have time. I believe yeah. in you. I don't know. He's pretty old. Yeah, I, I have to actually like you know, contribute. I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty good at liking other people's posts, but as far as like putting something else out there is. Other than new show, come watch. I, I don't know how many other posts I do other than that. So, fair. And I would say that I'm too busy, but you know, 
talk to you and now I we all know that's a lie. Dare say that. So and Tim is our favorite Canadian. Um, we can say that now because there's no other Canadians on that we know of. So but um let's see. So what else is what is up next for Amber Toro? I mean, up next is releasing Umbra, right? That's going to be the next three weeks, the focus. And then I'm hoping that I can take a little bit of a step back from content creation and focus on book two. Oh, see, this is why I shouldn't be allowed to talk. <laughs> so, uh, yes, it'd be nice to take a break and only do, you know, four hobbies. Um, well, it is getting ready. You know, cycling season is upon us, dude. Yeah, that's true. Yep. The weather's getting nice. So definitely, yeah, want to take a little step back from so much focus, right, on the, the writing and just draft book two, which will be fun, and ride my bike. So I, I want to make myself jealous here. So which national park do you live closest to? Because, you know, Utah well, has such. six. Oh, really? Yeah. I live right at the uh, the base of Provo Canyon, so like my typical ride is going up Provo Canyon. Um, but there's yeah, lots of really pretty rides around here. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm I'm still upset. I was taking my nephew. We're going to do Utah and then do the Grand Canyon, and COVID hit. Oof. Yeah. So we had to cancel, and now he's in law school, and he's like, I don't know when I'll have free time, Uncle Mike. Uh, I don't want to go hiking by myself. I'll never come back and no one will know to look for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, um, one year we actually biked out to the Grand Canyon while that road was still closed. And that was wild. Cause then you're out there like 50 miles and realize if something went wrong, like there's no vehicles out here. The roads are totally closed. You'll just have to find a cougar or a bear or something <laughs> to help you know, lug you down the path. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was really cool though. JC says that uh, we'll look for you there, Mike. <laughs> Search party. Well, you're more likely to find me in a donut shop than, you know, on a trail. But, you know, we'll look there first. Yes, yeah, search them all. Just See for me. Trail of crumbs going into the woods or something. Uh, okay. It, Amber, is there anything that we didn't ask you that we really should have? I don't think so. Yeah, okay. we talked about Ombro and the Kickstarter. So that was great. Our work here is done. <laughs> so no one is left mad yet. So that's good. We, we keep right. our streak intact. Um, so your book comes out April 24th in 22 days because we have to be exact. We can't say just over three weeks. That's right. We're <laughs> um, Star Trek Voyager is the best Star Trek. Um, <sighs> Why are you trying to pull me into that? Man? It's late. She's been sitting here for an hour. She doesn't want to get into this. I will take Voyager. I mean, it has a female captain and seven of nine. I'll, I'll give you that. You've obviously missed our last episodes. Oh, yes. I'm sure this is going to open a can of worm. I saw your face. I, I, I You're entitled to your opinion as wrong as it might be. That's fine. It's all good. Okay. So do you have any more interviews lined up, Amber? I, I do think I have, a, I think I have like two. Yes. Um, I totally just follow my calendar right now. Everything's so busy and hectic that it's just, it's on the calendar and I will show up. So okay, fair. Well, let us yeah. know how the book launch goes and, uh, and we'll make mention of it here on after April 24th. Yeah. Awesome. And hopefully we will be competitors against each other in the science fiction self published, the system of both. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. So, Awesome. Well, uh, right. thank you for showing up and putting up with our shenanigans. Thank you um, for having me. That's fun. Joining us as well. And Always yes, nice to have you here. Thank you for everyone else who showed up and asked questions since we didn't have any ready. Um, oh, that's not true. We're, we're always good <laughs> for a couple of questions. And uh, just in case you're wondering, we will be back here in two days talking to Juliana Caro on the 4th of April. So what's that? Thursday, right? Yes. She cool. is a booktuber. Um, I love her videos. 
That's, I did not need to find another booktuber to follow because I follow too many as is. But, right. uh, you know, sometimes you just have to. So thank you again, and good luck with the Kickstarter. I mean, you don't need luck. You're doing, you're killing it. But uh, can't wait to see what else you put out, and hopefully, hopefully you'll be back on our show sometime. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, cool. take care, Amber. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.